Oh. All right. Well, I first heard about Swami in 1969. I belonged to the ARE, the Association for Research and Development, Edgar Casey Organization. I'm a life member, and I've been a member for over 60 years now. Anyway, I heard about him. I went there for Dream Week because I was studying my dreams. And there was a very beautiful woman there in an Indian sari by the name of Hilda Tarleton. I don't know if you've heard about Hilda. But anyway, we were sitting in the lobby of this Marshall's Motel at the time. And Hilda was there. And I could have said she was sitting on a sofa. And I could have sat with her on that sofa. But there was something about Hilda I wanted to sit at her feet. She was a holy person. And uh, so she asked us if we had any questions. And I said, well, I read a book about called uh, uh, Life and Teachings of the Masters of the Far East by Baird Spaulding. I said, do these people really exist? And she said, oh, yes. So she went on talking about uh, the various masters that she had met. And the, the woman who had brought her there was an editor with, uh, I think, McGraw Publishing. And she said, well, I'll see if we can get a room in Hilda that can tell you more about her stay in, in uh, India, which was for over 20 years. <clears throat> so the next day she did. And there was just a handful of us that went. So Hilda had all these large pictures, colored photos, of all these masses she had met. And one was one with a man in a red robe and this Afro hairstyle. And she told us how she had uh, gone to India and met all of them, and that she had been with this particular master. And that she had actually, she knew people, a family, where the father had been raised from the dead. And of course, that interested me in, in these miracles she was talking about. So after this conference was over, uh, I w came back to St. Pete. My brother was teaching at UCLA, stage design at the time. But I'd never been to California. So... <clears throat> I decided to go visit him. And of course, I wanted to know more about this man with the Afro haircut. So he took me. He lived in Santa Monica. So I told him I wanted to go to this Sci Center because I'd looked it up in the telephone book. And he said, oh, you don't want to go there. There are a bunch of hippies. And I said, no, I, I would like to go. So reluctantly, he took me. And it was all very foreign and strange. But they had a bookstore, and uh, they all had pictures. And I bought a picture of the man in the red robe with the Afro haircut and uh, went back, came back here to St. Pete. Well, time went on. I got a book through the mail from England. Oh, it was a brochure, and it listed... I never had never had asked for it. I never knew the people who sent it or anything like that. And I looked through the list of books, and there was one called Man of Miracles. And it mentioned this name, Sati Sai Baba. So I thought, well, I, I'd like to read that book, and I sent for it. So I got that book. Well, by that time, I was really interested in going. And so I wrote to uh, I wrote to the this SAI uh, Indra Devi's uh, organization in Hollywood. It was in Hollywood, and asked about it. And I got led back, thinking, you know, sometime years ago, later, I may be, I might hear about them. Well, I got one right back saying she was going in 1973, and I could go with, with this group. Well, the date was kept being put off. So 
so finally, it was uh, February 1974, uh, when I did get on the plane from Tampa to New York. And I thought to myself, you know, I may be going to my death. Well, I was. That was a spiritual death, really. So I met these people in New York, and we all got on the plane, and among them were Bob and Barbara Pazandi for the first time, Wilma Bronke for the first time, uh, Jack Hislop's sister-in-law, Graciela McMartin, was on that list. Uh, there were about 50 of us. So we arrived there, uh, and we had to wait to go to Prashanti because it was Mahashiva Ratri, Indra Devi went on. We didn't know anything about Shiva Ratri or anything like that. So we got there the next day, and everybody had cleared out. So the, the ashram was almost empty. So here we had all this time with this divine master, Sachi Sai Baba. We, we, and, and the, you know, the first, we were in a in interview, group interview with him. And I usually am not pushy, <laughs> but I did push myself up in the front row. <laughs> and I got there, and when he finished talking to us, uh, and the Devi said, well, you can touch his feet or something like that. Well, I kissed his toe. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was a uh, most unusual stay. It was, it, so many things happened. Most of the time I was, I was sick because I couldn't eat the food. But one thing that happened that was very significant. I had been drinking a lot of lime juice because nothing would stay on my stomach. So I went to to uh, early morning uh, prayers in, in the hall because there were so few, just a handful of people then. And while all the legends were going on, and we were, and then we were sitting in silence. My stomach started heaving, and much to my horrible embarrassment, up came all the lime juice. I was soaking wet, Try, had my sari, I was trying to contain it. Here I'm sitting there in the parallel, and I'm thrown, sitting in a puddle of water and all these people around me. I thought, oh, I've desecrated this place. Horrible, what a saber doll finally got me out. And she, of course, she thought that the worst might have happened, but I got back to the room and rinsed out the sari. Well, I didn't have any clean saris. I had one that had come back, because I'd only gone with two. And uh, it had never been ironed. So when we went down, went to go for, for Darson, all I had was this wrinkled, Cotton sorry, nothing else to put on. So I put it on, and there were just I don't, probably 10 or 12 people in the darshan line. Swami just came out, and here we were just lined up there. And two of the ladies said, well, sit with us. So we were just a few steps from the steps of the mandir. So Swami came out, and he chose them for an interview. And I was sitting next to them, like a bedraggled animal, <laughs> a cat or dog. And he turned around and he looked at me and he said, go. So this divine master took this poor <laughs> bedraggled creature who thought she had desecrated the prayer, <laughs> the prayer, called me for an interview. So here we were, and he gave us his calling card, and talked to us. And I, I had several questions that I asked him. I, and uh, they were spiritual questions, and he answered them. But I just, I was struck by the fact that I looked so horrible. 
and feel so awful. And he loved me, although I didn't realize that at the time. But he didn't push me aside or anything here. He invited me in. So how can you not, how can you not love some, someone like that? So anyway, I think, uh, I think we were there for about three weeks, I'm not sure. And I came back, and later on I got a letter from Janet Rock saying that uh, I was invited to go back for the 55th uh, birthday. And I thought, well, I don't represent anybody, you know, but I, I'm going to go back. So in those days, I was working for the city of St. Petersburg. It never made much money and didn't really care. <laughs> but uh, I borrowed the money from the credit union because you could borrow at 3% then mm -hmm. and pay it back very quickly. So I went back. And that was so interesting because we were, uh, I was put on a committee, everybody was that went, I think. Uh, to for suggestions for centers for the Western world, and uh, that was very interesting. And not only that, but uh, Don Heath had arranged a pilgrimage of all the centers from starting near Bombay, going all the way up to Rishikesh, and then over to Calcutta, Ramakrishna Mission and back for the 55th birthday. So that's how I first went to Baba. And you could never pry me away after that. <laughs> well, the Tampa Center, as such, actually began 1976. But uh, when I got back from, uh, it was 19, in 1975, from that uh, 55th birthday celebration, people uh, would get in touch with me, apparently. They might have asked Indra Devi about somebody in this section of the country, and they would uh, call or come and wanted to know something about Baba. So I just invited them to come to my home. and. Uh, it was a Sunday, and I would uh, tell them what I knew. And also, Barbara Bozani had told me there were uh, learning tapes available. So I got some of those. And that's, it was just informally uh, set up. I was just Baba's instrument, so he could send people. So later on, when they were organizing the centers. They uh, wanted, they sent me a notice to apply and tell the reasons why we could be a center. So we had been doing service, because to me that's always been very important. Service uh, at the St. Vincent de Paul soup kitchen, mm -hmm. I think was the first. And uh, so that's really how it became a center, because we did attempt to learn bhajans. There were only, only uh, Westerners, no Indians, until 1980 when, when Jay and Indita Kama came. So we didn't have any translations in the very, very beginning. And, uh, but we just learned by rote and uh, would follow what Janet did on the tape. So. After I filled out uh, all the information about our activities, then we were accredited as a center, and that was, I think, uh, that was 1976. So actually, I, I always took took the date as New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve, uh, 1976, that we started. The changes uh, over the years have taken place, actually. The first big one was there were only 
uh, English-speaking deputies, uh, only Westerners. Actually, the first ones to come were Russians, and then we had a, a, a Latvian, uh, and then some Americans too. But only three or four, you know, for, for a long time. And until uh, 1980, when Jay and Vita came. And the one thing that, to me, was so significant was that uh, we had a budget book. And uh, Jay and Vita always made sure that they sang in English, which was just wonderful, because we didn't know how to pronounce any of these others. We didn't know anything. You know, we were, we were, lear were learning all these things. So <clears throat> that was a, a very significant step when, they, when Jay and Gita came. And then Indian, uh, various Indian uh, people would come that were uh, stationed in Tampa, or they would be coming through for a visit and would come to the center. So uh, later on, all the all the Americans or the Westerners died off, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't I don't think we we had any at one time any Westerners at one time. One of the the biggest changes, however, that occurred was when uh, Jane Gita took over the center. I had served as the president for, I think it was 19 and a half years it met at my house. And I couldn't do it any longer. And uh, we, we met at another Devadee's house. Uh, she, she was from uh, San Salvador. And then after that, uh, they couldn't do it for a while, and Jay and Gita took it over. And we met at their house, and then they they offered us this wonderful meeting place now on Belcher Road. That's that was so significant. And of course, there's a big uh, Indian population now in Pinellas County and in the Clearwater area, probably more the so than in St. Petersburg. Although now we have so many doctors from India that uh, we have a wonderful uh, ethnic diversity now in uh, Pinellas County. So the changes have been uh, phenomenal since, uh, since they took it over and, and Gita and, and uh, we all dug in, particularly with an accent on service, and with uh, Gita as the uh, coordinator for that. We've done, the center has done remarkable things, and is doing wonderful, wonderful service in many respects. It's a wonderful cooperation, and the most intelligent people, you know, to me, beside deputies are the people I want to be with. That's the way I've always felt. They're, that's where I belong. And uh, I think that this is the general feeling. This, uh, this is such a wonderful organization. Without compare. Without compare. The service activities that the center does then and now can you describe some of the service activities that the center has done? Well, when we first started, I had to look for ways that we could serve because we had so few people. And that was at the uh, soup kitchen for St. Vincent de Paul. And we would, about seven or eight of us, and and her two little girls and uh, a few of the others, we would go down there, set the table for lunch, uh, help dish out the food. Uh, at that time, I don't. I guess we did help with the vegetables, but we did work in the soup kitchen there, 
And then later on, uh, I contacted Salvation Army, and some of us went and worked at the Salvation Army. And through that contact, uh, we were, uh, I remember that we, we were able to, to establish a good relationship with uh, the, the director at the time. And uh, I don't remember how it was set up, but uh, with all of us working together, there was a, a, I think we had a big uh, medical, medical camp there wonderful cooperation and a lot of a lot of uh, people that came uh, to to have their blood pressure checked it was uh, more checking things I've forgotten exactly what all these specialties and then from that the next time uh, once those contacts had been made with the city there was always, with the city or with the uh, with the actual uh, organization, there was no other way. We couldn't do anything on our own. So this has been really for us the way to go, because now working with the free clinic, when when uh, our our members go and work there. On Saturdays, uh, Danielle, who is a member who works there during the week, volunteers. Uh, the service activities are just particularly astounding that have taken place. And it's all, all due to the hard, hard work and the leadership, really. Gita has, has given just wonderful leadership to that. And, Everybody else is trying their very best to cooperate and follow. So the center has grown, and it, and it will. So I'm hoping that we will have more Westerners now that will come. Well, Swami's passing for myself, uh, because I'd been away for so long the last time, I was there, it was 1990. He was in my heart, so it wasn't, it was a shock, but it wasn't, it wasn't uh, devastating for me. Uh, because I, I hadn't been there for so long. Uh, I can't, I can't speak for the other members because I really haven't been attending regularly because of the health problems. So I, I really can't uh, speak for how they felt. Uh, for those who were in close proximity to him so often and so frequently, I, I know that it was devastating for them. Uh, Susan Caffrey, who recently passed, who uh, wrote the music for uh, I am God. You probably know that wonderful, that wonderful budgie. Susan's family, Susan is, or was from St. Petersburg. I never knew Susan before I met her on the first trip uh, because I think she had, can't, had come from California. But um, say I'm losing my train of thought right now. Uh, or, or the passing. She, uh, this is very interesting because she was sent back about, uh, she lived there for over 30 years. And uh, Swami sent all the foreigners back home. And she was one of them that came back. And uh, I know she, uh, I saw her and she expressed her, her disappointment and she said, oh, after all these years, Swami dumped, dumped me. That's the way she felt. Well, actually, he made the most wonderful living arrangements for her that couldn't be beat. Uh, her sister told me that when she died, actually, she died here in St. Petersburg. 
she was a great devotee. And uh, I think that uh, his passing, I think she understood why she'd been sent away. And that settled things for her. But it was interesting, the, the way she passed. Um, I understand that she'd been on a bus and been taking grocery shopping uh, the way they do at these apartments. And she told somebody that she had had a, felt, felt a stab in her back, as though she'd been hit, hit on the back. And uh, she went back to her apartment. And I think she died a day or two later. Swami took her very quickly. Mm. And so uh, I think the wonderful thing is that she was reconciled and understood that it was for her own good that Swami had sent people back. It wasn't that he was abandoning them. But she could understand after that that he only thought the best for all his devotees. For the future in the golden age, to me, it, it's already here for a lot of us. <laughs> um, we have we are Swami's messengers now, and we have to to live our lives as his disciples, just like the disciples of Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be ever mindful, and I always think about watch. Watch your words, watch your acts, watch your thoughts, watch your character, watch your heart. There's, and in that, there it is, on five fingers of the hand, to be mindful of those things. It covers almost everything for us. Uh, I, think, I think that critical mass has been, re has been reached. I think we've gone past that. I think the avalanche is snowballing, and I... I I have shivers when just that when I say that because that is to me that signifies truth. This is true. It is. It's back. We've we've reached that past. We're on this way to this marvelous age where more and more people will love God and they will what instead of being content with power and things like that they will want God. Very few people in the past have ever wanted God. So we're, we're bad. We're crazy. I'm glad to be. <laughs> I, think, I think the crazy world is out there. <laughs> I left that a long time ago. And I'm very happy. It's the best thing that ever happened to me and to all of us. We're so, we're so blessed. I cannot find the words to, to thank our beloved Swami, for, for everything. They're just everything, everything, everything. And I, I realize more and more every day, I have more understanding. He is, he's the doer. He is the doer. Always. We're just, we've kidded ourselves. Our egos are just, well, to me, the illness I am now going through is I'm paying back karma. I know that. I'm very aware of that. And my inner voice, I talk with my inner voice. And I get all the answers. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to live. So all I can say is, you know, to me, read, read his, his teachings, practice his teachings. Live, live, live the way he has taught us to live, and more and more people will all be, will all. The golden age will be, will be here for it is here. It's here for everyone. We just have to open ourselves up and practice his teachings. Practice, practice, practice. Apply them. In our daily lives, to me, this is, this is this is the way to go, and it's the easy way. It's a wonderful way to live. That's 
that's my feeling. I wouldn't. With all all the all the wrong acts I have committed, he's accepted me unconditionally. This is so wonderful. Unconditional love. And to, so to me, our real duty is to love everyone unconditionally. If we are his disciples, that's our duty. And I try to practice it here where I live. And you know, when I see someone who is grumpy, and most most of the people who are here are very grumpy, a lot of them. <laughs> I, I let that love flow through to them. And you know, within a short time, they're looking cheerful, they're acting better. It's, it's astounding, this wonderful love of his that flows through us to others. Because I realize they, if we are gods, and the Bible says we are, and I believe that, they too are gods. We're all one. We're all one. And so it's, it's love. It's letting his love flow to us so that we are the channel, greater channels of blessings to all those with whom we come in contact. That, that's my prayer for all, for all. <laughs>